Welcome to Brain in the Vat. Today we are joined by Justin Califf, who is an assistant teaching professor at the University of Rutgers, one of the most lauded philosophy departments in the world. And um, Justin is going to be talking to us today about moral relativism. Um, Justin, would you like to start with a thought experiment? I like thought experiments that come from that come from real life. So this is actually a, this is a story that really happened. I, I knew some people in Yorkshire, some some good friends of mine, who and some other people who were uh, visiting from, stu visiting students from from China. Well, one evening, the Chinese students invited over these these two uh, Yorkshire students for a home cooked Chinese meal, and the the two students from Yorkshire went over and they were served a delicious meal which they ate, and it was so delicious they ate everything on their plate. And in fact, in Yorkshire, at least maybe all of England, I don't know, but the, the rule is that you should not leave anything left on your, uh, you shouldn't leave anything on your plate. It would be a sign to your host that you didn't, uh, that you didn't like the food enough to eat it all. So they ate everything, and they thought that was the whole meal, but then their Chinese hosts went into the kitchen and started making up more food and bringing that out. So, and this went on for some time. They kept eating all the food on their plate, and they thought this is delicious food, but is there... <laughs> <laughs> is this going to go on uh, forever? And at a certain point, they just had to say that they couldn't eat any more food. And it was a bit uncomfortable on both sides. They didn't realize until later on, in fact, none of them realized that there was a, an interesting culture clash going on there. That it turns out that in, in China, they have exactly the opposite rules. In China, if, you, if, you, if you're a guest at, at someone's home, you show that the person has taken care of you hospitably by not eating everything on the plate. You leave a bit left over as if to say, you've, you've served me so, so well, so generously, that I can't even eat everything you've, you've offered me. And conversely, if somebody is, so, so if, if you're Chinese and somebody um, comes over and eats everything on the plate, it's a sign that the person must have been starving and, and you, you didn't do, do a good enough job, so then you have to go and, and, and get some more food. Now, the interesting thing about this is that both of these systems of ethics are completely consistent within themselves. You know, there's, there's nothing, if, if everybody is, understands what the rule is and follows that rule, everything works out fine. The problem is what happens when the two cultures come into, into contact and then, and then there's this conflict. Now, here's the, here's the relativism question. If, if, if we want to say, you know, what's, what was the right thing to do in that situation? It might be time to ask that, but we can probably see that that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not, like, it's not as though the, the, um, the Yorkshire people had it wrong and the Chinese people had it right or vice versa. There is no right or wrong objectively. There's just what's right for Yorkshire and what's right for, for China, and that's it. And this, this, this also applies to many other things, like, for example, which side of the road we, we, we drive on. I think there in South Africa, you drive on the left side of the road. Uh, right. And I'm a, I'm a Canadian now living in the States, and in both those countries, we drive on the right. Uh, now, if, if you came over here and were driving on the left side of the road, you would cause all kinds of, <laughs> of accidents, and you'd be doing the wrong thing, just as I would if I went there and drove on the right. But again, there's no objective answer to the question, who is right? Well, there's the right thing to do in South Africa, and there's the right thing to do in New Jersey, where I am, and that's it. So, mor so moral relativism is the view that this kind of thinking applies to all cases of morals, that there's never anything that's objectively right or wrong to do. What's right or wrong is just, it just depends completely on what culture or, or country you happen to be a part of. So these are great cases, Justin, because in these cases, it seems quite clear, right? It would be crazy to say it is morally wrong to drive on the left-hand side of the road, regardless of where you are. Right. Um, that seems nuts, right? And, it, you know, it is morally wrong to finish the food on your plate, regardless of where you are. Or it is morally uh, wrong not to finish the food on your plate, regardless of where you are. And, and if you extend this to everyday cases, if you think that this is the perfect prototype, well, then you would reach the conclusion that we should have moral relativism throughout our society, throughout all our rules, throughout everything we do, without, throughout any judgments. We purely look at the cultural norms. We ask the question, does my act fit these cultural norms? If the answer is yes, well, then it's morally fine. If the answer is no, well, then it's not morally fine. And I think this idea of, of cultural relativism or moral relativism is very appealing to a lot of people. Um, and we can see it starting to come out in some of, of the political issues taking place today in America. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about um, how, how moral relativism is cashing out with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the death of George Floyd and the reactions to it and, and with the protests. Sure. You know, um, it really, this, you're, you're right. This applies to every every moral issue. And I think, I think that 
um, as you say, people are very drawn to this idea. You can see why, because we, um, it seems, it often seems that we have two choices. Either we, we accept a single, a, a single standard and a single culture is the dominating one, and we don't want that. You know, we don't want to say my culture's ways are right and yours are wrong. That, that seems terrible. To, it seems bad to me and it seems bad to many others. So then it begins to seem, oh, maybe instead of saying the, the morality is based on my religious text or my cultural history or something, everybody just gets to make it. Every culture is equally good and we don't want to say anything bad. Um, and so I think people are really attracted to this, but then because they're attracted to this, they end up saying things and thinking about morality in ways that tend not to be very coherent. And, and, I, and I say this respectfully in, in a certain sense, because I've, I've had lots of conversations with people, very, very smart people who work in, in the tech fields and all these, they're, they're very, very smart. Some of them have PhDs in, in very technical areas, and yet they, haven't, they, they tend to underestimate how complex philosophy is. And this is one of the things that where they often make a, a quick judgment. So let's let's talk about the um, the the protests in the protests in the wake of the George Floyd killing. Well, some people will say things like, you know, to, to apply relativism to the protests, for instance. Uh, we were talking off off air about some people who pulled down uh, um, statues or destroyed monuments. So some people say, you know, from my perspective, this is a bad thing to do. But then again, um, maybe. Maybe there's a subculture according, uh, that, that has a rule that you could do this, or and, and and you often hear people saying, "Who are we to judge?" You know, you're not you're not you don't live under the circumstances of the people who are pulling down the statue. Who are who are you to judge? Or um, this also comes up with some very culturally specific uh, practices, like the female circumcision uh, practice is one that often is, is mentioned, where some people say, "Well, we certainly wouldn't want to do that," but that's because we have a certain culture and other people have a different culture. So as you say, it could, it begins to, it begins to feel tempting to say, you know what, all of morality is like this. It's never, it's never the right thing to do to say that's wrong, period. But then the George, the killing of George Floyd itself is an instance of something that I think we all agree was, was terribly immoral. We, we know that there was this person who was, was being de detained, the, the police could have restrained him without killing him. They had many opportunities to do so. Nonetheless, he was killed. And people say, that was the wrong thing to do. But, if you were, but, then, but then if you were to take moral relativism seriously, somebody would have to say, well, you're not a police officer. You don't come from that same culture. Who are you to judge? And then we wouldn't be able to make any judgments about anything. And morality wouldn't really get off the ground at all. Or it would get off the ground and you would just have some people saying, you know, my culture says that's wrong. So we say it's wrong, your culture says it's right, and then there's, there's no way to resolve the conflict because you can't have a moral conversation. So anyway, that's, that's how I would apply it. Yeah, so you raise something intuitively appealing about relativism, which is this idea that you know, people, I think, like this notion that we don't judge, um, that we withhold judgment, that we sort of say, well, there's certain norms and we don't understand why you do that, but you have a rich heritage. And so there's one way of cashing out relativism, which is this idea that, well, if culture A believes X to be wrong, uh, then it is wrong for culture A. Um, and if culture B believes that X to be right, well, then it is right for culture B. Um, so you can have this contradiction and it's all relative to the particular culture that believes it. And then there's this addition of, but it is always wrong for culture A to pass judgment on culture B. And that judgment itself is non-relative. It is an absolute judgment. And so we see this, internal contradiction straight away where we say, well, hold on. What if culture A believes that it is perfectly right to pass judgments on uh, culture B, that that's part of their cultural norm? <laughs> we see right. that you know, the system cannot, cannot sustain itself. Um, I, I think you also raised something interesting, which is that maybe, I mean, imagine that the defense of the police force was to say, listen, we have a strong cultural belief, which is that um, when we apprehend someone choking the life out of them, is what we believe to be right. Um, we don't believe that we need to restrain ourselves um, in action, and that actually we, we believe that the more innocent civilians that we kill, the better. That is our cultural belief. It would strike us as a, an utterly abhorrent response, um, and that there's something sort of unsustainable about saying, well, just because this is our culture, therefore it's right. Um, so there's some sense of trying to work out how do we deal with these clashes? Um, how do we reconcile maybe some of the um, uh, things that seem appealing about culturalism, this idea of non-judgment or a non-kind of Western imperialism where we say, well, maybe we're wrong. 
you know, maybe uh, as Westerners, we we don't believe the right things, and you know, we should let other people do their stuff, um, while at the same time being able to pass some judgments that are morally absolute. Right. Yeah. And and people and if if somebody in response to that, if, if somebody said, well, the you know, we we members of the police community, if they were to say we think that that killing civilians um, should be done as as much as possible, we don't just want to say in response to that, well, that's your belief, and it goes against our beliefs. We want to say. Your beliefs are wrong. Period, and you know I, th I think I think it's really important important that we have to say that. Another response somebody might give is to 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 to, to me and and to you would be well you know being a police officer is not part of is not doesn't count as being a culture, but this this raises some very interesting questions about what a culture is, and and I think that when people think about relativism and the first people to discuss relativism, uh, they, they were they were writing at a time when there really were some cultures that were completely sealed off from sealed off from other cultures you know an island culture in the middle of of, of the ocean that hadn't had any contact with with anyone else but in, in, in this day and age it's very hard i think to draw some cultural lines you know if people people within your own nation belong to different cultures but do they belong exactly to the same culture what if they, they might have an ethnic uh, heard something ethnically in common with these people racially in common with so i mean culturally versus racially and then they might have a religious commonality with some other people. And do they have a language in common? It, it gets to be very, very tricky. And, and, um, and a lot of people do talk meaningfully about subcultures. So I think trying to get away from it by just trying to specify what cultures are doesn't solve any of the problems either. It seems that what we need is the ability to say at certain points, you know, yeah, this, is, this kind of thing is wrong, period. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable with so I wonder whether there's not a way out for the cultural relativist. I mean, you know, it's a philosophy show when you're adopting positions you don't want to adopt, right? Just for the sake of argument. Okay, so, so th there's, a, there's a philosopher, I think his name is James Rachels. Um, and, and Rachels gives this response. Um, he says, you couldn't have a culture with a rule like we want to choke as many innocent people to death as possible because he said that culture won't be self-sustaining. There's something in that rule that will undermine the existence of the culture itself. Imagine a culture of people who just walk around and choke innocent people to death. What would happen is there would be such disruption in society and all these people dying that the society couldn't function and it would implode and so you wouldn't have the culture. So, so one of his requirements for a rule to be part of a culture is that it must, you must be able to imagine it to be a culture that's self-sustaining and um, that that rule isn't self-contradictory in some important way. Right. That's interesting. I, I think, I think um, James Rachels was a very, uh, a very, I, I really like him a lot. I, in fact, the first ethical, the first, the, the first philosophy course I took was a, a moral theory course and the professor who I later became friends with Used uh, use that textbook, and it's quite. It's called Elements of Moral Philosophy, and I think it's it's introduced a lot of people to moral thinking. It's so clearly written, so many great examples. I think I think in that case that he gives, he I think he's he's probably right. You, there are certain kinds of of moral systems that are so bad, like choke everybody you see immediately to death immediately, that um, any society would either die out or fall <laughs> apart very quickly if it tried to sustain it. So I think he's right about that, and then. Is, but but does it does it work for all the cases? I'm not sure. I mean, you know, there there are going to be some. Uh, for example, um, um, you know, a lot of people in in this in this conversation about George, about George the George Floyd killing, talk about the influence of of slavery on um, on the and and an institutionalized um, um, like you know, racist slavery, race based slavery on uh, on the demographics and the uh, differences within the United States today. Now. Um, the interesting thing about slavery is that for all, you know, I, I, think, I think we all agree that it's, it's a really bad moral system, uh, but um, has it been able to persevere? Yes, in fact, for most of history, most of the cultures of the world had slavery. The Egyptians had slavery for, I don't know how many thousands of years, the Egyptians, uh, you know, during the heyday of, of Egypt. So I think that if, if, you, if the only limit, if the only guard you have against relativism is, um, well, some societies are so bad they'll fall apart. You're going to have to swallow um, a whole bunch of stuff like like slavery that I think we'd like to resist. So slavery strikes me as a fantastic example because, as you say, there is a long history where people believed that 
slavery was perfectly legitimate. You could enslave another culture, another nation, so you didn't have to worry about the internal contradiction. You would perfectly subsist well as a culture, and that you could benefit off the backs of those that you enslaved. And uh, the viewers then, well, when everyone believed that it was right to enslave um, you know, the others, it was right. The relativist has to say it was actually right. And then when there was a change in belief, so for example, in America, where there was a move towards abolitionism, those abolitionists were initially wrong in believing that slavery was abhorrent because they held a minority view. The cultural norm was that slavery is perfectly legitimate until they got a sufficient amount of people to support them, in which case the culture changed. And then people believed that slavery was wrong. Um, and then it became wrong in virtue of the belief. Um, and if you continue to practice slavery, then you were doing something wrong. There's a, something troubling about this in the sense that we move from, you know, the abolition of slavery while without being able to say that there was any moral progress because it was perfectly right to enslave people when people believed it was right. And then it was perfectly wrong to enslave people when, when people believed it was wrong. Um, but there isn't a sense of we have bettered ourselves because all we did was change our belief states. Uh, right, right, exactly. And, and it's, so yeah, that's another, another way to try to get it, to get around it is to say, well, our culture doesn't have, um, doesn't have slavery because people worked towards it. But the people who were the abolitionists who, when they were a minority, were working towards the abolition of slavery. They only did that because they, um, they had the belief, which we say is a correct belief, that, that they were in the right. But according to relativism, they were actually in the wrong. And, and according to relativism, back in, back in the slavery days, people like Harriet Tubman, who's now being celebrated um, uh, in various uh, new ways in, in the United States. She, she took many uh, slaves from the American South and uh, brought them to, to freedom. She was actually acting immorally, according to moral relativism, because at the time, slavery was, was permitted and the stealing of slaves or the freeing of slaves um, against the wishes of the, of the owners uh, was, was not permitted. So yeah, that, that, so that, that, that leads us to some very strange things. Also, suppose it happens, and I hope that this never happens, but if, suppose it happens that slavery comes back. Now, all of a sudden, as soon, as soon as slavery becomes morally accepted again, it will become, it will become morally permissible and it will be morally wrong to oppose it. So, so then that, I think that really, that, that example illustrates very well how relativism leaves, leaves morality and all our strongest moral convictions at the whim of, of history. So there's something very interesting going on here, which is there's, there's a relativism about what morality is, right? So is morality relative to people's beliefs at the time? Or is it just our knowledge about morality that seems to change over time? And it seems like the, the moral relativist might conflate the two. So on the one hand, we might want to say, no, there really is a right or wrong but at any given time, there's a different code in our society. The knowledge, or at least the beliefs about what is right at that given time is relative to, uh, uh, you know, it's relative to history. It's relative to where you are and the norms at the time. But, but the bigger question is, does that also mean that the metaphysics, the ontology, the existence of morality itself is relative to people's beliefs at that time? And the moral relativist is saying yes, right? But it seems like when you give these examples like slavery, it seems like the, 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 the objective, or at least the metaphysics of morality and the epistemology, knowing about morality, seem to come apart. And that's the problem that a, a lot of moral rel relativists have, is they say, but hold on, when you say it's wrong, they'll, always, they'll ask this question, wrong according to whom, right? So they're trying to introduce the epistemics, the knowledge about morality as being the primary source of what morality is, rather than the metaphysics of reality being independent of our knowledge of it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that seems right. And, and so, and by asking wrong according to whom, they keep, they, they're, they're, they're already presuming the truth of, of, of relativism. But the only th way that something could be right or wrong is if it's right or wrong according to, to somebody. Now, interestingly, you know, they're, um, the, the big discussions about slavery being wrong altogether, just to take slavery, those big, those big discussions, um, I think they, they began um, in England and also in the United States in the latter part of the, um, of the 18th century. There was uh, Wilberforce and, uh, and Payne in, 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 the, in the UK and the US 
I think we're having these conversations. Before that, I don't, as far as I know, there weren't any people who were, who really tried to argue that slavery, or the, uh, on a large scale, that slavery needed to be entirely abolished. You know, it was, it would have, it would be a bad thing to become a slave, and there might be some good things about releasing slaves, but there wasn't this view that slavery was wrong altogether. So what about those times when nobody thought that slavery was wrong? Um, so in, in that case, if, 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 if the wrongness depends on our knowledge of, of, of the wrongness, then there was no wrongness at that time. So what, if you take, what if you take a long-term view? I'm trying desperately on behalf of the culture sure. relativist here, but what if you take a long-term view and you say, okay, morality is relative to our beliefs, but it's our ultimate beliefs that matter, not our beliefs along the way. Along the way, we meander. Our beliefs change backwards and forwards along the way. But in the end, we come to the right beliefs and morality is relative to those beliefs at the end of the day. And, and progressives will say, we've come to those beliefs now, right? So now we've come to those beliefs. We've finally woken up. We've enlightened ourselves. We've, we, we woke, right? So that, you know, they, they use this, this term, right? We've, we've woken up. We, we, and now we've come to the ultimate set of beliefs relative to which morality exists. Interesting. So, so when, you're, when you say we will ultimately come to these beliefs, you don't mean we individually will, but that our society, as we go through the generations, perhaps, will ultimately converge on this one set of, just in the same way that we've all come to agree on the facts of mathematics, we're going to agree on, on morality. And so the right thing to do is whatever is, um, yeah, whatever, whatever is, is morally right according to, according to that view. Now, is, is the claim there, this, is, this gets into a little bit of tricky philosophical territory, but I'll try to keep it less technical. Is the claim that the mere fact that we converge on these beliefs is what makes it right or wrong? Or is it that we're converging on a certain set of beliefs because they are already right and wrong? In, in other words, what's, what exactly is it that's guiding the development of this um, unfolding and building idea of, of morality? Right, because I, I'm assuming each of those horns of the dilemma is going to have a problem associated with it, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, I, I, I have some philosophical tra training, so I can see it coming, but show me what's wrong with each of the horns of this dilemma. Sure. Well, um, you, you, because of, you, you probably recognize this as a version of, of the famous Euthyphro problem from, um, that if any of your readers have, have read Plato's dialogue, The Euthyphro, they might recognize it. In the dialogue, for those of you who haven't read it, I guess it's a bit of an obscure work. Um, um, Socrates is in a conversation with this fellow named, named Euthyphro, and, and I won't go into the whole story, but at one point, the, the, the crucial point of the entire dialogue, you have um, Socrates asks Euthyphro, um, um, you know, whether, is, is trying to get Euthyphro to give an account of what counts as pious. He was interested in, in piety rather than ethics, but the similar, similar reasoning works. And of course, the ancient Greeks didn't believe in one god, they believed in the gods. So, also, so, so in, in trying to figure out what, um, give an account of what it means, what it is for something to be pious, Euthyphro says, the pious things are whatever the gods, uh, whatever the gods favor. So if the gods like you, want you to do a certain thing, that's a pious thing to do. If the gods don't want you to do that, that's an impious thing to do. And that's all there is to piety. And then Socrates comes back at, at Euthyphro and says, are the pious things pious merely because the gods say that they're pious, or do the gods uh, are the, are, um, do the gods say that they're pious or think that they're pious um, uh, because they in fact are? So, so here here are the two possibilities again. Possibility number one: we will ultimately converge upon um, a certain set of beliefs, not a certain set of moral beliefs, not because those beliefs happen to be objectively morally right. It's just that, you know, we just happen to converge upon them for some reason, you know, and that reason could have to do with advertising and the mass media and whimsical changes of culture and who knows what. But somehow or other, the whole world ends up converging on a certain set of beliefs that involves things like eat a hamburger every Friday and never sit on a chair on Tuesday or, you know, just, just some crazy random things like that. And then, and then how somehow or other, because those are the, the, the beliefs that everyone in the world holds, those become the rules of morality. Well, if it's, just, if, we're, if it's just going to be something like that, like whatever we happen to all agree upon, then it's not clear why that should tell us anything about morality at all. It seems that all kinds of crazy things could happen between now and then. If it happens between now and then that, that, that people decide that racism is, and slavery are good after all, that doesn't seem like it would just make it good, or, or good overall. It would just, it would just mean that 
somehow we got things wrong. Um, so, so that doesn't seem to be very satisfying. The other possibility is to say, well, no, it's not, we're not talking here about a random process of, of all kinds of crazy stuff um, happening and then somehow we, we converge on moral beliefs. We're talking about people coming to converge on moral beliefs because we get smarter and smarter about morality. We have all these great conversations here on this blog and elsewhere, and then ultimately this leads to everybody discovering the actual moral truth. But in that case, it's the actual moral truth that makes it right and not the fact that people have converged on it. So if people, so, so to summarize that, the two horns of dilemma are um, um, the, things, the, the, the things that are morally right are right just because people happen to converge upon them. And in that case, there's no reason uh, behind those things, so that doesn't seem to give us morality. And the other option is that people converge upon uh, this idea of what's right because those things are right. And in that case, great, that does give us morality. But then there was already a reason, there was already something that made that right before we converged upon them. And then we still have to ask, what is it exactly that makes the right things right, the good things good? So one way of cashing this out is that we can accept something like descriptive relativism to be true, which is the claim that different cultures believe different things to be true. Now, we know, for example, that people used to believe that the earth was flat, um, and then they changed their minds and believed that the earth was a geoid. Um, now, the difference in belief you know, descriptive, we can say people believe different things. It doesn't make them both true. It didn't mean that the nature of reality changed given the beliefs. You know, we just were mistaken um, before when we believed the earth was flat. Um, now, so we might think a similar thing about morality. That's when some people disagree about morality, they're just mistaken. Um, that just because we disagree doesn't make, make us both right. You know, it's not about our belief states, it's about something external. But here's the difficulty. Throughout this conversation, we've made this assumption that there is a true, absolute morality. Um, and so if you take relativism seriously, they might say, well, how do you get there? What are your, what are your norms? How do you explain where this morality comes from? You know, there's no book in the sky. There's no you know, absolute thing that I can touch. There's no scientific method I can use to sort of discover this morality. All we have are these cultural norms. You know, and so if you want to work out what the law is in a particular country, there's no divine method to kind of get there. You look at the statute books. So if you want to work out what's moral, you look at the cultural norms. Um, that's all there is. There's nothing underlying it. Sure. Yeah. You know, this this thing that you raised about the the shape of of the earth is 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 great, and I think that it uh, one of the really great things about it, and and the reason I think it's well worth considering is that people. Um, people I find often get get these these questions confused. The question about, about whether um, whether something is true or whether it's believed to be true. On the one hand, there's what we there's what we consider to be the case, and then there's what actually is the case. And, and these and these are two completely different things. And I think a lot of people, when they think of morality, when when I start saying such and such is wrong, they 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 think, oh, what what Justin is saying is that this this such and such is considered wrong, but going back to the, the, um, the, the killing of, of George Floyd, some, a lot of the people who, who, are, um, who talk about this say, this is morally wrong and, our society, and yet our society condones it. Well, if your society condones it and it's morally wrong, then morality can't just be a matter of what your society condones or condemns. Um, and and so, so I, think, I think already you can see some of the, some of the difficulty right there. Uh, anyway, you, you wanted to go beyond that and you were asking me about what uh, okay, if we're not going to just read morality off um, a description of how people do act, where can this come from? And I, I think that's, a, that's one of the really difficult questions in, uh, in morality. And I think that intuitively we are able to do it. We're able to see, yes, this, this thing did happen. Um, George Floyd, in this case, was, was killed. And it was, um, some people say it was morally condoned. Or and take other things like the killing of the Jews in the, in the Nazi Holocaust or, or what have you. These things were socially condoned, and yet they're wrong. And there were people, you know, in, in Nazi Germany at the time who said, my society condones the killing of the Jews, and yet it's wrong. So then we have to ask ourselves, where does that thing, it's wrong even though my society um, uh, condones it, where does that judgment come from, and what, what justifies it? So there, there, are different, there are different answers to this question. I think some of the best, um, you know, in, in, a, in a certain way, you don't even need to think that much about it. You can just sort of see that you can just, you can see in a certain sense that, that it's wrong. Of course, the way that things seem to you isn't always correct. Sometimes something will seem to be very wrong. And when you 
look more carefully at it, it turns out not to be wrong and vice versa. Rawls has this view that you've got to do a kind of reflective equilibrium between our intuitions on the one hand and our theory on the other. So he thinks that sometimes our intuitions might be mistaken. Um, for example, I think for a long time, people held the intuition that uh, two men can't get married, uh, that it's wrong. Uh, and I think if you polled people, they would have said, of course, you can't have such a thing as gay marriage. It's, it's unconscionable. It's wrong. It just feels wrong. It's unnatural. Um, and, you know, then you kind of have, let's say, your kind of moral theory, which tries to cash out why things are wrong. So you might think about, well, is morality a matter of uh, you know, agreement between individuals? Is it a matter of suffering? Is it a matter of rights? Um, and then you play this game between, between the two, and sometimes your theory yields results which are very counterintuitive. So utilitarians, for example, are going to say, well, we, we do um, the greatest good for the greatest number. And occasionally that's going to mean that we have to sacrifice some people along the way, that there, there's no ultimate moral limit. Um, you know, if we have to um, you know, kill a newborn baby to kind of come up with some cure for COVID, well, that's what we do. And other people might say, well, that's so counterintuitive. There must be a problem with the theory. Uh, and on the other hand, we might say, well, maybe our intuitions are wrong and maybe we need to accept this theory. I, I, I think there's something to be said for this approach of trying to do the balancing act. But the concern is one of, you know, the utilitarian just says, so what about your moral intuitions? You know, um, you know, how are you getting to these things? You know, philosophers typically are sitting in their armchairs with their cognac and saying, well, intuitively, I feel that this is the right thing or the wrong thing. You know, and then you have some experimental philosophers are going out and saying, well, let's go and ask a couple of uh, weird students on campus and see what they think about this. Um, and intuitionism might start to look like, you know, a little too close to relativism in some sense, which is you just ask people, do you think this is right or wrong? And they tell you how they feel about it in the moment. Um, what's the kind of deep uh, core about the intuition itself? Why should we value it at all? We, we generate these intuitions pretty readily, but once we have the intuitions, we have to weigh them up against, um, against opposing, in, uh, against uh, other intuitions and look around things more carefully, hear what other people have to say. And sometimes through this process, we end up, changing our minds and thinking that, yeah, well, this, this initial intuition was a pretty strong intuition, and yet it, was, it, it, uh, it tricked us. It, it, it made us uh, think the wrong thing. I wonder whether there's not some interesting appeal to the objectivist, right? So the objectivist says, the objectivist says that morality is objective. It's not relative to, some, um, to, to somebody's belief. Um, or some set of beliefs, some culture's belief at a certain time, or even at some ultimate time, um, things are objectively right or wrong. And, and the reason we started this whole discussion is we said, well, there's difficult cases for the objectivist, right? So um, the case really that seems to be problematic is um, idiosyncratic cultural beliefs and judging of those cultures, right? right. So, um, and it seems like the objectivist struggles to get around those problems, but here's one way that he might, right? So right at the beginning of this discussion, you said you wouldn't, you feel it's not actually that great to judge another culture. Um, there might be instances where you do, but, but, it, but, on the whole, it's, it's generally something we shouldn't do too much of unless it's really necessary. And I wonder whether there's a way to cash that out for the objectivist. And here's one way to do it is to say, well, morality is very complicated. There is an objective right or wrong in every case, but it's very complicated or difficult to get there. You know, we might have to apply quite a sophisticated type of utilitarianism, um, which is the view that an action's right just in case it maximizes utility for society as a whole. And it might be quite hard to work out what that is, what the most utility is, which action it's associated with in any given circumstance. Or if you're a Kantian, it might be that um, you need to uh, respect the dignity of everyone involved, but you really need to do a really long think about how everyone's dignity in the situation is weighed up and, and how is their, not weighed up, but how is their dignity fully uh, respected? Um, and, so, and so because morality, even if it's objective, is still very complicated, we shouldn't jump to judgments, right, about other cultures because we might not have engaged in that, that process of thinking through the problem long enough that we're in a position to do so. It seems to me that, that a lot of us, and a lot of people in general, we, we feel very confident about our ability to, make, to pass moral judgments. We don't, we don't often have the patience, or many people don't have the patience to think things through carefully. And I, I always feel it's one of my jobs uh, as, a, uh, as a teacher of philosophy to try to get people to just be curious enough to stop and think and, and not be sure. 
And it seems at first, uh, so it, it, it seems that a lot of people go through the following stages. First of all, they start thinking about, about morality and, and typically they've been taught by their parents or by the schools of a certain moral view, whether it's a Christian moral view or a progressivist moral view or whatever it is. And they think this is, they've got all the answers. And then they start to see that other cultures have very different answers to certain questions. And so as soon as they think they've got all the, when, when they think they've got all the answers, they don't really think about it at all. Oh yeah, I know the answer. Well, that's stupid. I can't believe somebody thinks that. That's obviously wrong. And then they start thinking, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe um, there's something to be said for this other culture's view. And then they still don't want to think about it. They say, well, you know, there's what I think and there's what that person thinks and whatever I think is right for me, whatever that person thinks is right for him or her. And that's the end of it. They don't think anymore. And, and it's only when you get beyond that to the point where you say that there's objective morality where you can say, wait a second, there is not, it's not just what I, there's not just what I think and my, and my culture thinks that I can just automatically make a judgment on the basis of. There, there are some facts out there, some moral facts that I don't know the answers to. And I can't just turn to my culture and say, does my culture say this is right or wrong? I can't just turn to the law. I can't just turn to my school system. I have to think it through. And I might think it through incorrectly, but the, you know, I always imagine it like there's a, there's a, imagine a mountain and you know, here I am and there's something on the other side of the mountain and I can't yet see what's on the, maybe I'll never be able to see what's on the other side of the mountain, but I have to think it through and talk with other people and reason about it. But there That's is still something on the other side of that mountain, right? Exactly. Even if I don't know what it is, but it's there. You don't know what it is, but it's there. And, and this is the view, I mean, to answer Mark's question as well, this is the view I want to hold, which is that there is objective morality, even if at some point we're not too sure what it is. Right. And interestingly, if you're a relativist, you're always sure what it is in a certain sense, because if I'm a relativist, well, what's the answer to this moral question is whatever my culture says about it. So I just need to look at what my culture says. There's the answer. Uh, there's no more poll, thing. Right? You, you just do a poll. Once you, I do a once poll. You, a poll yeah. you know. Yeah, right. Right. And so there's, so there's, there's no curiosity there. And, and especially, you know, I, I was talking before about the, the difficulty of outlining what a culture is. And I think some people are, some people think that if you start thinking of, in a, in a modern multicultural society, what is your culture? It might just be you, you know, you might. And so, and then, then we're in a certain kind of, of variation of relativism called subjectivism, where for something to be morally right is, it, is for it to be approved of in my moral system. But then I can easily tell whether something's right or wrong. I just say, oh, that seems right to me. And, and there it is. Whereas if, if as, as long as I think that there's something out there that I can't know, then I have to, then I have to be a bit reserved. So I think interestingly, some people say, I'm a moral relativist because I like to be modest in my beliefs. I don't want to over, overstate how much I, I know. In fact, it's the other way around. It's people who believe in objective truth who can fully say there's something that there's, it's either right or it's wrong. Here's my best guess, but I don't know if I'm right and I should keep looking. Yeah, so there seems to be a, a, a difficult virtue in that approach, which is the sense of saying, this is a hard problem. This is a, a very tall mountain, and it's not going to be easy to climb it. Um, I mean, Derek Parfitt, in his uh, ultimate work, um, What Does It All Mean?, talks about this idea of different moral theories kind of converging through these different paths to the top of the same mountain. Um, but it's not not straightforward and the relativist in some way just tosses off the hard work and they say well whatever the culture believes and i don't really want to think about this too much further and, you know you're a cultural imperialist there's something else that you touched on that's fascinating for me which is this if we think about intersectionality as a movement you know this idea that you know you have these multiple different identities so you know you could say as a um gay trans black south african um I say the following. And so you've got all these multiple identities that converge. Um, and what's interesting is I think some people say, well, once you add enough identities, you really just wind up with a particular individual. In other words, saying, well, you know, once you've got all this detail, all this texture, well, then it's whatever Mark or Justin think. That's the actual sort of subjectivist account of morality. Um, but I read a piece by James Lindsay and, and Helen Pluckrose lately, which they sort of said, well, actually, it, it cannot be that. It's not a horseshoe which converges on individualism. Because ultimately what it is is that the moral view is always through the prism of the identities. It is always through the collective. There is nothing individualist about it. There is nothing sort of classically liberal about it. Um, you're always reflecting through these particular groups. So it's not that I think this, as you say, well, people who are part of this group, people who are Jewish, believe this stuff. And so I'm going to put on my Jewish hat at the moment, and I'm going to say whatever the Jewish norms are, um, that is what it is. And they may very well conflict with 
uh, you know, uh, the gay norms or the trans norms. Um, but you sort of just, you know, put your hats on accordingly. I'll bet if you took all the, what was it, gay, trans, um, black uh, South Africans, you would, and you ask them their questions, ask them their, their views on a range of moral issues, you would probably get all kinds of different things because people can have various um, uh, identities and preferences without converging. So, so I think what often happens is people say, well, you know, you, <laughs> you think that, but that means that you don't really belong to this group um, at all. There was, there was a, a funny kerfuffle um, that I know that some black people were um, unhappy with in, in the States recently where, where Joe Biden, the, the, the Democratic candidate said, um, if, you, if, um, like if you don't agree with that, then you're not black. I, I forget exactly what the, what the whole thing was. If you support um, Trump, I think it was if you support Trump. Yeah, then, yeah, that's right. And so, so, so and, then, and then some people, some black people, even black people who didn't support Trump said, well, who are, you know, <laughs> don't, don't you tell me what constitutes as being black. But then it was interesting that, of course, it raises this idea that, you know, if, if black, if being black is some essential um, part of you, can it, it's so weird that it could just be taken away by your having, your voting for a particular political uh, figure. Anyway, my, my point is that you can, um, the only way that you can get this kind of agreement between um, among members of a certain demographic is if you say that people who belong to that demographic by any other means who have the wrong beliefs, they, they don't count anymore. So I think what you end up is a pretty artificial, <laughs> a pretty artificial group that probably doesn't tell you all that much. Well, you, you get into something interesting, which is, you know, there's this fuzzy notion of what counts as the culture or the group. Um, and on some level, it might have actually nothing to do with taking the poll. It might have to do with a kind of small vanguard that says, well, if you are gay, it's not just about, you know, having sex with people that are the same sex as you. It's about a, a sort of a other kind of um, a set of political beliefs. So Peter Thiel was described as not gay uh, because he was a Republican. Um, and so you have the vanguard sort of, you know, reinterpreting words um, and saying, well, group membership or the true culture is this, you know, no true Scotsman would ever, you know, um, vote for the Tories or whatever it is, you know. Um, so there's, there's some sense in which it's, the, the relativist has a way of saying, well, I think I know what the culture is because I can look at what, you know, um, what people say, but that in itself gets fuzzy. So um, and, you, and you can have different vanguards vying for power as to who is really setting the norm. Um, and it, it really kind of seems to devolve into a power struggle as opposed to anything more substantive. It feels like a kind of jiggery pokery when you're trying to figure out who, you know, who, who gets to count as, as, as part of this group. Maybe, as, as you say, these are now just new terms that, that apparently don't refer to the things that they seem to refer to. Like, I've always thought of being gay as, as being a matter of, your, you know, who, what... Um, are you are you male or female? What are your sexual preferences? That's the limit to to being gay. But if if and now it means that you you belong to the group or don't belong to the group according to whether you're a Republican. I, I, yeah, it seems, it seems that people are at this point playing with words. Look, we're a philosophy show and we try and tolerate a bunch of things. But the claim that there are such <laughs> essentials as men and women that kind of oh, okay. it's a little bit too far. <laughs> if you don't mind, Justin, please can we just can we just sort of not get us banned from YouTube? <laughs> I'm so much in the dark about everything. <laughs> Don't worry, you're really not, Justin. And just to be clear, Mark is absolutely joking. Okay. I don't want to get you banned from YouTube. It looks like a good <laughs> Unfortunately, I might not be joking about the latter half. You know, who knows what will get you banned. <laughs> I think it will get you banned from Twitter if you claim that uh, there are people who are born a particular sex. Um, you know, maybe the cultural norms will change. Two, two clashes of cultures around uh, norms around food. Okay, so I think there's a very interesting uh, answer to why neither is right or wrong, neither is better than the other, without referring to moral relativism. And, right. and, and the answer would be, well, they both have equal utility, right? Mm. So, so if you're a utilitarian who's an objectivist about morality, you might just say, well, no, neither one is better because neither one results in better utility. They're about the same. I like that a lot, you know, and I think, I think, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I think there are parallels to that in other areas. For example, if we're talking about health, let, let's say, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, the doctor says you should have a bowl of fruit at this, at this time and you should have this many. Well, should you have uh, blackberries or should you have raspberries? It might be that if you ask the great uh, dietary medical experts, it doesn't matter, you pick one or the other. And, and that, doesn't mean that, but that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that it would be just as, just as good to eat anything else that you could have eaten, you know, there, uh, maybe, you know, the, the, 
the guidelines of health and nutrition can only tell you so much. And, uh, and as long as you've got something that works, great. And, and, um, and so there's room, for, there's room for, for flexibility there. And um, it could be that there are certain, once, as long as you've got a, as long as you've got a which, which side of the road do you want to drive on, right or left? Pick either one, it doesn't matter. Morality is not going to tell you which side of the road is correct, but you ought to do what other people in your society are doing because otherwise you'd have car accidents or else people would have to drive so slowly nobody could get anywhere. Uh, but morality won't, to, to say that there are objective facts doesn't mean that every single thing that you could do is either objectively morally right or wrong. And I, and I think this is an important point. There's a, there's a fellow, um, Gilbert Harmon, whose work I was really deeply engaged with in my dissertation, and I met him later on, and, um, and in this conversation with him, it came out that he thinks that to be a moral relativist is to say that some moral, um, some moral actions are relatively right, you know, the, the, the rightness or wrongness of, of some moral actions is relative. But I take it, but, but then it seems to me that you're, the way that he set it up, you're either an objectivist, in which case you think absolutely everything is, is objectively right or wrong, or you're a relativist where you say absolutely everything is only relatively right or wrong. And then it, it seems to me that there are a bunch of things like, you know, killing a person, killing an innocent person um, when you, when you, when for no good reason, um, as my, as my um, early philosophy teacher in the first year course used to say, holding the next door's baby underwater and uh, drowning it just to watch it squirm um, for the fun of, you know, if I think if you say that's clearly wrong and it doesn't matter what your culture says about it. Um, but then when it comes to other things like which side of the road should you drive on, it's relative. And it seems that the way that I think of being um, an objectivist, all you're saying is there are some moral issues on which there is an objective right or wrong. And, and that's all I want to be committed to. But that's I, weird, right? Isn't that weird? Because you yeah. would need a rule to determine whether this case is a moral relativist case or an objectivist case. And you, that rule would have to be objective, right? Right. But I like your rule. because Your rule is, 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 a, is a utilitarian rule. So now as, as, it seems like you were suggesting that I'm running into a problem here. Am I? I think there's another more elegant solution, which is that not all things are uh, matters of morality at all. Um, they're just non-moral. So as you say, whether you eat blackberries or blueberries um, is not a moral question. It's an aesthetic question. It's something else. So, you know, and it seems that our original case is really a question of etiquette, um, which is non-moral. So you could have either etiquette system, whether you're on the left or the right hand side of the road, you know, it's a coordination problem. It's not a moral problem. Um, it, it has moral considerations in the sense that if, if you didn't coordinate, if you didn't have an agreement, you'd have people crashing their cars into each other and that would lead to bad things occurring. But there is nothing moral about which side of the road you drive on. And I think that's the other thing that's useful about reflecting on relativism is it gives us a couple of lessons. The one is, as we said, being able to sit and think and reflect about our moral rules and maybe being a bit humble and saying, you know, maybe I was brought up in a particular tradition and I could be wrong. Uh, you know, I'm on the one side of the mountain and once I climb to the other, I'll realize that I was wrong and I'll have some underlying reasons for it. The other one is to realize that morality only covers so much, um, that not everything is a, is a moral question and that there are other things that we need to understand. You know, there might be, for example, you might take some people that take the view that they're relativists about taste. Um, that whether um, Picasso is better than Monet is not an objective question. Um, it is just a matter of how you feel about it. Of course, there'll be other people that say, you know, Pushpin is not as good as poetry and there are objective things, but neither of these things are moral. And so we don't have to resolve that question yet. The relativist thinks he's being humble in holding relativism, right? So, so he thinks that this is the kind of the woke view. This is what you come to when you realize that what you were brought up believing isn't necessarily correct just because you were brought up believing it. Um, and so you turn to relativism. And I think what was so fascinating to hear you say is that actually if you think about it psychologically and the way that your psychology progresses, there's a step after. So, so, so you start with, I, I'm going to hold whatever my parents taught me. And then you move on to, okay, there's other cultures that might believe differently and so I might be wrong. And then you move to, well, actually we both equally right but the relativist hasn't made the next move, which is, no, there is an objective answer. It just might not be the one that I was raised to believe. 